Isabel Oakshot, Talks International editor, is with us dissecting the King's uh, speech. I don't know, Isabel, whether you've ever been to one of these. I went to one about 10 years ago. Um, a very impressive stuff, and you know, it looks incredible. I said at the beginning that even the most ardent Republican can't fail to be impressed by the pomp and the ceremony of it. I, I hope that never goes away. It's something that I, I think we do really rather well, and it looks beautiful, and the setting and all that goes with it. But of course, underneath it is really the words of the government of the day. And of course, it happens to be a Labour government right now. Makes no odds to the monarch, we are told. But there he was this morning, uh, laying out his big. 20 30 point plan for the next uh, year or more for this government uh, but it does i think we can all agree isabel that you know the, the setting and the, the the entire event is pretty impressive stuff right it really is i've been in parliament for many of these not actually in the chamber because that's pretty difficult to access i mean it's absolutely packed to the rafters yeah. I don't know how I wangled a ticket for that on that particular occasion. I think I was suddenly standing in the right place at the right time at the bar, I think. Well, may maybe, yeah. <laughs> um, it was definitely a hot ticket to have. You know, yeah. the, amazing, the, the, um, the ladies actually wear ball gowns. You know, this is quite an extraordinary spectacle. And, and we should absolutely keep with this stuff. You know, it really does present Britain yeah. uh, for the proud historic nature uh, that we are so uh, we, that is so rich about our, our culture i guess and our heritage and there are all these kind of quirky traditions around it uh, of course it uh, takes place in in the house of lords doesn't it so yeah. um, again the media um they're generally their passes are, are more for the for the commons which is why it wouldn't have had um easy access to that but you see these carriages you know the amazing golden uh, opulent carriage coming past with the king and queen one feature that i that i think is a constant whether it was uh, uh, the late queen or, or this king is that they always make these bills sound so boring you know they read it out and it's amazingly kind of, boring <laughs> yeah they read it out in this totally flat monotone and you're kind of like did you not you know did you not kind of get yourself a bit geared up for this you know could you put a bit more energy and life into it but i almost think that was part of the gig you know they're supposed yep. to just remain absolutely level you know nothing about their tone should uh, suggest any judgment about the legislation yeah. that they're reading out in their own name. I think the um, year the year that I went, uh, which was up when Gordon Brown was prime minister, was the year I think they kind of um, curtailed it. They made it a shorter. It used to go on what seemed to go on for hours, but this was a yes. a, 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 a much um, as they have done with budgets more recently. They they they've made them a little swifter and therefore more digestible. But yes, we we don't want to certainly lose that touch, even if it is sort of delivered with breathtaking um, and d almost disturbing levels of boredom. Um, let's move to this part of the bill, children's well-being bill. And this is another one of those, Isabel, that I, I look at and think, well, you know, that's good intentions. Who doesn't support children's well-being? And then you sort of look a little deeper into some of this and you start to wonder about the sort of state versus individual kind of relationship, uh, build to raise standards in education and promote children's well-being, measures to remove the exemption from VAT for private schools, which is so uh, horrendous, uh, it's almost criminal, I believe, and I hope somebody somewhere is taking out a private prosecution uh, to the government for this. This will enable the funding, they say, of six and a half thousand new teachers. Don't believe that for one second, but, and breakfast clubs and all the rest of it. What do you make of the general uh, idea of uh, the state becoming almost the uh, third parent, as it were? Well, this is no surprise coming from Labour, is it? And look, I don't really object to schools, primary schools, providing breakfast. It's an absolute travesty that parents are unable to provide food for their own children before they go to yeah, school. But if, there, if there is a good use of public money, then maybe this is it, you know, actually making sure that kids have something to start the day with. There's lots of evidence, apart from on a human level, um, as to why children should be fed before they try to have a morning of lessons. So I don't have any objection to that, and I don't think many of our 
uh, listeners will, although they'll probably be appalled that a, a parent is unable to feed their own child, especially with our pretty generous benefit system. Um, and secondly, another positive thing I noticed is an attempt to at least begin to get a grip on uh, the rising population of so-called ghost children. These are children who have never returned to education yeah. since the pandemic. And unfortunately, that problem is still a very persistent one. There's also been a concerning rise in the number of so-called homeschooled children. Now, there are some brilliant examples of homeschooling by fantastically committed and you know uh, truly highly educated and competent parents, but I strongly suspect that the moniker of homeschooling is being abused uh, by feckless parents in some cases as a cover for their kids just not going to school, as, uh, as a cover for them as parents neglecting their duty. Uh, so all of those things, uh, well, I hope that the good is actually acted on. And I hope that simply setting up a register of missing children isn't as far as it goes. That sounds like a typical Labour type thing. Let's just make a list and have a meeting. I want to see uh, those children found and looked after and got back into the system so that they've got a brighter future to look forward to. Spot on. And just a final one, uh, not the government of the day, but the opposition of the day, the Tory leadership race. Uh, at the moment, looks as if it's an all-woman uh, list so far. Priti Patel has said uh, she's up for it. Kemi Badenoch, uh, Suella Braverman, uh, as we understand it. There's sort of three names there. Uh, do any of those uh, enamour you with uh, excitement, uh, Isabel, or is there another name out there that you think could actually make this thing called the Tory party work? Well, we will also get Tom Tugendhat, I am sure. So, so No, I said somebody who could make it work. Uh, yeah, we will end up being an all-woman lineup. <laughs> I think if Suella Braverman took over the party, uh, then she would pull it in the right direction. But that's not going to happen. She's extremely divisive within the parliamentary party. She has made lots of enemies. I think she's, um, you know, her ideals are in the right place. Absolutely, she's been very brave. But unfortunately, uh, she has rubbed a lot of her colleagues up the wrong way. So I don't think she'll win that. Uh, Kemi Badenoch is clearly the favourite, um, and I think she will do at least some of the right things. Um, but again, she's not hugely liked, Kemi Badenoch. No. Um, so, you know, whether that actually gets in her way, I don't know. We'll watch with interest. Isabel, as ever, thank you. We will speak again soon. Isabel Oakshot is Talks International Editor.